Okay, folks, uh, I think we'll uh, kick off this evening. Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this evening's uh, webinar event on lighthouses, lightships, and the commissioners of Irish Lights covering the period 1914 to 1923. Uh, my name is Hugh Rowe. I'm the Director of Corporate Services in Irish Lights, and I will be your moderator for this evening's event. As you may well know, the Dublin Festival of History is in its, in night, it's, in its ninth year, and it's a fantastic initiative organised by Dublin City Council and Dublin City Libraries. Irish Lights is delighted to present the talk this evening as a partner organisation with the festival. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the Commissioners of Irish Lights, and to give some background to this evening's talk, Irish Lights is the organisation that is responsible for the provision of marine aids to navigation around the coast of Ireland. We're probably best known for our lighthouses and coastal beacons, but we also manage a network of large buoys at sea and a suite of electronic aids navigation. Our mission is to keep the mariner safe, and that extends beyond commercial shipping to the fishing industry and the leisure sector. We're also responsible for the superintendence of over 4,000 local aids navigation, including those within harbours and, for example, at aquaculture and other offshore activity sites. And finally, Irish Lights is responsible for the marking and removal of dangerous shipwrecks outside of harbour boundaries. We're a fairly unique organisation insofar as we provide our services on an all-Ireland basis, and we work closely with our, uh, general, our sister general lighthouse authorities, Trinity, Trinity House, that looks after England and Wales, and the Northern Lighthouse Board that looks after Scotland and the Isle of Man. And together, we provide an integrated safety service to the mariner around the islands of Great Britain and Ireland. So just a little bit about our history. Irish Lights has been in existence for some time. Uh, it derives its origin and uh, legal constitution from the 1786 Act of Grattan's Parliament that established the Corporation for preserving and approving the Port of Dublin with responsibility for lighthouses in the immediate area. That was followed in 1810. Uh, the Lighthouses Ireland Act was extended, uh, sorry, extended the powers uh, of the Port of Dublin to cover all of the duties and functions relating to lighthouses around the coast of Ireland. And then in 1867, um, Dublin Port Act was uh, vested the responsibility for lighthouses and, li and lightships, uh, buoys and beacons in the Commissioners of Irish Lights. And effectively, the Dublin Port was split into what we know today as, as, as Dublin Port and then the Commissioners of Irish Lights. So as I'm sure you can appreciate, we have a long history stretching back over almost 250 years. And over recent years, we've been working hard to bring our archive up to modern international standards. Uh, and our earliest records uh, date back to uh, 1810. So our archive project has been led by my colleague, Neve Collins, and it has brought to light many key documents that illustrate the richness and the scope of the Irish Lights uh, collections. And a lot of the talk this evening will draw on the content of the Irish Lights archive. So I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Owen Kinsler, our speaker this evening. Owen is a professional historian and founder of History Works, providing historical consultancy and research services in the fields of heritage and public history. He holds a doctorate in Irish history, for, uh, he holds a doctorate in Irish history from uh, University College Dublin, and over the past decade has worked on historical projects with a wide variety of body, bodies, including the Department of Foreign Affairs, the Royal Irish Academy and Irish and RTE. His most recent book, uh, A History of Dublin City University, was published last year by Four Courts Press, and he's also currently researching the centenary of history of the Defence Forces. Owen is working with Irish Lights as part of its ongoing heritage project and his talk this evening is going to give you an overview of how Irish Lights and its employees fared during the turbulent years that began with the outbreak of the First World War in 1914 and ended with the Civil War. So before I hand over to Owen, just a few logistics before we start. Um, the talk has been recorded and we will have links to the recording set up on the Irish Lights website and it'll also be available on the Dublin Festival of History's History website. The talk will take about 35 minutes and we'll have, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. The talk will take about 35 minutes and we will hopefully have some time at the end for questions. If you do have any questions, can you please pop them into the chat area at the bottom of your screen? 
and we'll take as many as possible at the end of Owen's presentation. So I'll invite you all to sit back, enjoy the presentation, and I'll now hand it over to Owen. Thanks very much, Hugh, for, for the kind introduction and for, for moderating proceedings this evening. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be working with Irish Lights on this project. It's, as Hugh's outlined, it's an organisation with a long and, and fascinating history. And just within Irish Lights, I just wanted to quickly thank Deirdre Beardmore, Jane McPartland and Neve Collins for helping me to put this event together. And of course, it's a real pleasure to be back speaking at the Dublin Festival of History again. Thanks to Kate Chandler for making that happen. And huge thanks to everyone who's logged in this evening to, to hear me talk about Irish Lights. Um, so as she mentioned, I'm going to focus this evening on that particularly eventful period of Irish and indeed global history between the beginning of the First World War and the end of the Civil War in Ireland in 1923. And what I'm interested in focusing on is not just how Irish Light's overall ability to fulfill its mission, as you said, that of ensuring safety at sea for mariners was affected during this time, but also for those in Irish Lights HQ and the lightkeepers and lightshipmen stationed around the island and what they witnessed and how they reported on the war at sea between 1914 and 1918, and then later found themselves in the middle of war in Ireland itself. And, and given that we're fast approaching the centenaries of the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in December 1921 and its acceptance by Dáil Éireann in January 1922, I'll also take a look at how the treaty had a direct impact on Irish lights and, in fact, precipitated a, a very long period of confusion over who bore responsibility for the maintenance and operation of the service and, indeed, the very future of the commissioners of Irish lights. But before uh, I dive into August 1914, um, I'll set the scene a little bit huge on most of it there, so I won't repeat this. And some of you might also have tuned into um, my colleague Neve Collins' wonderful presentation a couple of nights ago, which would have given you a good overview of the background uh, and the, the long history of Irish Light. So I won't go through the legislation again, um, but I will note that in the 19th century, which is when the Commission of Irish Light really finds its, um, its, its identity, it's, it, was, it was pretty much a golden era in lighthouse construction. We've, we went from... 13 lighthouses in 1810 to 74 by the end of the by the end of the century with another 11 lightships so stationary lightships um stationed around the coast east and south coast um like i said 11 of those and the early 20th century also saw the completion of the fastnet lighthouse in 1904 you've got a picture here just on the right hand side of the slide showing fastnet um under construction it gives you a sense of just um, I suppose the logistical and technical difficulties that would have been associated with that engineering project. And it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a marvel of modern lighthouse engineering. Um, <clears throat> so by the time that we pick up the narrative in August 1914, Irish Light, it's a highly efficient service. It's, it's well-resourced and it's, it's considered by its employees to be a very favorable employer. Uh, so mass travel obviously is still by sea at this stage. And the commissioners, I suppose, they were at the forefront of experimental technology to improve aids to navigation. So at the time, they were experimenting with submarine bells, automated fog signaling equipment, and improved lighting apparatus. Uh, these are all among the kind of the innovations that were being trialed. But um, the political, I suppose, the political and social landscape of Ireland is undergoing radical change at this time. And that's a process that's accelerated in 1914 with the outbreak of the First World War. And over the following four years, indeed, over the following nine years, Irish Light's mission was tested as, as never before. So it had a world war, the National Revolution, and the establishment of two separate states on the island of Ireland. And these would present a number of, of particularly difficult challenges to Irish Light's. Um, so it's, it's important, I think, I suppose, as well to set the scene and say that the Irish coast is a particular, in Ireland is a particularly, it remains, and obviously even more so um, at the time period we're talking about when we're looking at a time of mass travel by boat across the Atlantic. The Irish coast is, a, is a, an extremely important geopolitical point of contact for ships crossing the Atlantic. It's extremely important in terms of navigation, and the, I suppose the responsibility on Irish Lights was to make sure that that service and the, the service to mariners coming across the Atlantic, in particular during the First World War, wasn't interrupted. Um, and you know, in April 1913, just as I suppose the signs of war were gathering, the British Admiralty had advised Irish Lights that in the event of war, it would be necessary to dim or even extinguish some of the navigational lights that they held around the coast. And that advice obviously became a reality in August 1914. And for the next four years, lightkeepers 
and lightship men observed a very unforgiving war at sea off the Irish coast. And we have here, I suppose, from uh, really the beginnings of Irish Lights, a very deep involvement in the war effort. When you have a, a request from the Admiralty Intelligence Division, uh, you, you can see the letter here on the slide, to, um, to light keepers and lightship men to form a kind of a quasi coast watching corps. So they were requested to submit regular reports of submarine sightings, any sinkings of naval and mercantile shipping that they saw or observed, the activities of minesweepers and other patrols that were protecting Ireland's coast. And the terrible destruction and the human cost of the war regularly comes out in the reports that light keepers and lightship men were sending back to Irish Lights HQ in Dublin. And you know, as an example, in June 1915, uh, the assistant lightkeeper at Straw Island, a man named Alphonsus O'Leary, and Straw Island is on Inish Moor, just off the coast of Galway, he reported that the body of a woman had washed ashore. And I quote, uh, he took her to be one of, I took her to be one of the Lusitania victims. She had a gold wristlet watch on her wrist. The watch for the initials JCC. And grim discoveries like that and grim reports like that are a constant theme of what's being sent back to Irish Lights um, throughout 1914 and beyond. Now, like I said, at the outbreak of the war, there were 11 light ships operational off the east and south coast. I just have up here uh, on the screen an image of the um, the Cormorant lightship stationed on Kish Bank in 1908, just to give you a sense of what a lightship actually looked like. The light you can see it is the main in the center of the uh, in the center of the ship. The ball elevated above that is part of a recognition device, so that it, as well as having the name painted on the side of the vessel, the lightship could be recognized by the um, by the ball or by the signals it was displaying as well. So like their counterparts in, in lighthouses, lightship crews regularly reported on the conflict and submarine sightings were particularly common in the reports that they were sending back. And again, like lightkeepers, they regularly witnessed kind of the deadly consequences of the U-boat activity in their areas, its hunting of merchant and naval shipping. Um, there was also a financial incentive uh, here for, for lightship men and lightkeepers uh, for any information on U-boat activity that led to the sinking of a U-boat uh, if they signaled a, a nearby patrol boat and that, that signaling actually happened in the destruction of a U-boat, there was a financial reward there for them. Um, the crew of the South Rock Lightship, which was stationed off the coast of County Down, received £100 in December 1915 for their role in uh, signaling and capturing or destroying a, a U-boat. But, um, you know, the lightships, they were firmly anchored in place. They had no means of propulsion. So they're particularly vulnerable, I suppose, to the dangers of the war at sea. And like a South Rock and Cunning Beg lightships, um, and Cunning Beg is off the coast of County Wexford, they witnessed a lot of action in their vicinity. They're possibly the two most busy lightships in terms of reports that they send back to Irish Lights HQ. And on five separate occasions, Cunning Beg reported or rescued crew members of torpedoed ships and took them on board from lifeboats, frequently giving them their own meager supplies and their own clothing for which they were compensated by, by Irish lights. Um, they also, like I said, they reported regularly submarines, minesweepers in the vicinity and occasional wreckage. And again, lots of dead bodies drifting by the ship. And mines were a particular threat. In March, 1917, a floating mine lost its buoyancy and actually sank undetected below the Cunning Bay lightship where it touched the seabed and exploded, uh, lifted the vessel right out of the water, but remarkably it suffered no damage and there were no injuries to the crew reported. Um, the master of South Rock Lightship reported in May 1918 that a floating mine had drifted just four yards to starboard. So, you know, I can imagine that that was uh, led to a few tense moments on board. Um, U-boats, no less than mines, were, of course, a constant danger. They tended to leave lightships alone. They weren't a, a viable target. Um, but they hunted in the very, very near vicinity of them. And you have here on this slide a report from Henry Higginbotham, who was the master of South Rock uh, on Christmas Eve, 1917. And it's, it, I, I find these reports fascinating because they're quite, they're, I suppose they're official communications and official reports to Irish Lights. And they give an account of events in a very matter of fact way, but the events that they're describing are extremely uh, dramatic, they're dangerous, there's, um, there's danger all around at all times. And I suppose that they give a fantastic insight into, like I said, the war at sea off the coast, but also into the mentality of the people who would have been stationed on these light ships and um, their acceptance, I suppose, of the dangers that were presented to them on a very, very regular basis. And like I said, you can see here, the, the, the communication also has the, 
um, the, I suppose the official duty of letting the commissioners of Irish Lights know that there might be a potential obstruction because this large cargo boat had been torpedoed and went down right and lay lay right across the channel. So they're letting the Irish Lights, uh, commissioners of Irish Lights also know that they might need to investigate this for potential danger to shipping and something that might be an issue that need to be issued to mariners in a notice, um, a notice warning them of the potential danger. Um, other than South Rock, in March 1917, we do have an actual incident of um, a U-boat interacting with a lightship in a way that wasn't uh, that didn't turn out well, and it was reported in the press um, that month, March 1917, that the South Arctic lightship, the Guillemot, had disappeared, and that wasn't exactly accurate. What had happened was the lightship crew had observed U-boat activity in the area and signaled warnings to passing ships. It's a, a brave but a dangerous course of action, a new boat UC-65 eventually surfaced alongside Guillemot, ordered all on board to, to disembark, and then opened fire and sank the abandoned vessel. Um, at that time, uh, you know, lightship men were under, under orders from ours like not to signal and not to give away their position or not to endanger themselves by signaling ships of U-boat activity. So our sites were kind of curious, why did you do this? They were more than curious, they were irritated and annoyed because this is a major... It's a major expense to them, and obviously it's a major um, damage to the to the services they can provide. Uh, but Guillemot's master, a man named James Rossiter, he, he justified endangering the ship and its crew by stating that my duty as a British sailor was plain. I was desirous of doing my bit in my humble way for the empire. Now, away from the coast itself and away from lightships and from lighthouses, um, a lot of Irish Light staff were, were naval reservists and were either called up or volunteered for active service during the war. Now, some of the more highly skilled, which would have included light keepers, were absolutely essential to ensuring the continuity of Irish Light service and were very difficult to replace. So the majority of their applications to volunteer were refused. But even so, by, by mid-1916, 52 members of Irish Light staff had enlisted with British forces, uh, almost half serving in a naval capacity. And most came from district stores in, in Kingston or, or Dunleary, uh, or from light ship and steamer crews. There were four light keepers uh, who did volunteer or were permitted to volunteer, and eight head office staff. Now, three from head office, George Duggan, William Sargason, and James Watson, never actually returned. Watson was from Duncondra. He served with the 8th Hussars of the British Expeditionary Force and died on the 6th of November 1914 during the First Battle of Ypres. Now, Sargason had been granted permission by the commissioners to volunteer for the famous D Company uh, of the 7th Battalion of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, a PALS volunteer company formed largely by members of the Irish Rugby Football Union. And you can see Sargason's letter requesting permission on the left-hand side of your slide here. Um, and you can see just he ends with the sort of ends by saying that he wants to respond to the appeal for, for men to assist in upholding the honor of the country. Um, so Sargason's father actually kept Irish Lights updated as to his son's progress or his son's progress through the war uh, for the next few months and let them know that he was promoted to second lieutenant in the Connick Rangers. What included this kind of poignant observation that and I'm quoting here, he has been through a terrible experience in Gallipoli, and we have every reason to be devoutly thankful that he is unharmed. But unfortunately, he was killed in action at Salonika on the 6th of December 1915. Now, the third um, member of Irish Lights Head Office staff to lose a life in the war was George Duggan, um, who, along with his younger brother Jack, served with the 5th Battalion of the Royal Irish Fusiliers. And he was posted to Gallipoli in late July 1915, where the brothers fought in two separate companies. And on the 13th of August, there's a, a bittersweet letter where Jack writes to his sweetheart, Beatrice Seymour, telling her of a surprise visit in the trenches from George. And both men were killed in action on the same day, just, just three days later. And on the right hand side here, you have a letter from Duggan's father um, thanking Irish Light Secretary Hubert Cook for his expression of condolences uh, and, and saying that it was a, a great comfort to him and his wife, and also noting that he believed his son had been particularly happy while working for the Commissioners of Irish Lights. Now, the war ended in 1918, obviously, and on 15th of November 1918, Irish Lights were formally notified by the Admiralty that all lights on the coast of Ireland under their control should be exhibited at full power, and all fog signals, including submarine bells, which had been silenced um, during the war, again, to stop to prevent U-boats from being able to navigate by using uh, well-recognized uh, navigational landmarks. 
Um, they should be sounded whenever necessary and all normal arcs of visibility to, to be restored. So that marked an end to wartime conditions for Irish lights, I, you know, at least until the summer of, of 1919. And over the four years that followed, 1919, 1923, that period obviously covers the War of Independence and the Civil War, uh, a total of 29 lighthouses and fog signal stations were raided by members of the IRA. And we have it represented here on screen um, just to give you a sense of the geographic spread and you'll, you'll see there's a very very heavy concentration along the south and southwest coasts. So Irish Lights and its employees they were now forced to keep one eye on the coast and the other on an increasingly violent conflict between the IRA and British forces and then later within the IRA and the National Army of the Irish Free State. So, like I said, on particularly on the south and the west coast, Irish Lights employees and light keepers came face to face with armed IRA units, and the ability of Irish Light to fulfill its most, its mission over the next four years was seriously disrupted. In fact, probably disrupted in a way that the First World War hadn't impacted on the service. Whereas, you know, lights were operating at reduced power or reduced visibility, they were doing so under orders from the Admiralty. What was happening here was beyond what happened over the next four years was beyond Irish Lights control. So what was the motivation behind these raids? Um, were they initially an attempt to disrupt shipping and transport infrastructure as another form of increasing pressure on the British administration? And I think it would be naive not to believe or not to ascribe that motive, at least in part, to some of the raids, but primarily they were looking for equipment and explosives. Now, the majority of fog signals that were operated by Irish lights around the coast were explosive in nature. They required gun cotton, tonite and detonators, and these were precisely the kind of material that the IRA would be interested in getting its hands on. And just before I go on, a point that I find interesting to note, and it's, it's something that I want to make a distinction on because it, it has been said to me in the past or mentioned to me in the past that lighthouses were raided and destroyed or attacked and, and burned down, or at least yeah, attempts were made to actually damage the infrastructure of the lighthouse service during the War of Independence and, and, and the Civil War. And that's not actually the case insofar as I've been able to establish the Coast Guard service, however, which was an extension of the British security forces in Ireland. And a lot of Coast Guard stations were situated either very, very close to lighthouses, they were regarded as a legitimate target and you frequently get reports of Coast Guard stations being burned down and destroyed during the War of Independence. So I haven't come across any report of violence towards lightkeepers. Intimidation, yes, but not violence or destruction of Irish Lights property. Um, and I think that that's a pretty notable feature of the war. I think it says something about the identification of targets, the status of lightkeepers in, in society, and I think a respect for the, the vital nature of the work that they did. Um, so as early as, as September 1917, the, the commander in chief of the British forces in Ireland had inquired, you know, how secure are Irish lights um, stores of explosives. Um, now, in 19, February 1920, they reviewed their stock and it revealed that there were 21 tons of gun cotton scattered around the coast in lighthouse magazines, which is a huge store and a vulnerable store for potential raids. But when that review was undertaken in February 1920, only one lighthouse had been raided up to that point, and that took place in May 1919. So the urgency to protect these, uh, these, these vital stocks of explosives it wasn't yet there the ric analyzed the security of lighthouse stores in april 1920 and they identified mizzen head loop head and the old head of Kinsale as weak spots where police or military protection was impractical other stations such as the fast nest hall and eagle island were considered safe due to general in inaccessibility but that kind of optimism was largely unfounded and within weeks of it's it's it's, it's actually it's it, it's it's hardly coincidental maybe it was within weeks of that report being compiled um the ira began a sustained campaign of raids of light uh, raids on lighthouses and on fog signal stations um mizzen head was proved that the assessment of mizzen head as being particularly vulnerable was proven correct and that was raided repeatedly um, rendering it impractical to issue replacement equipment. Uh, it seriously hampered the ability of lightkeepers and fog signalmen to carry out their duties. 
And a lot of the reporting from Lightkeepers on these raids is similar to that report we had from the South Rock Lightship. It's quite matter of fact, clinical in tone. Again, it's a form of communication from employee to employer. So you don't get, you, you generally don't get a detailed insight into the effect that these raids might have had on light keepers. But there are glimpses all the same. And I, I mentioned Minehead. That was the site of the first lighthouse raid in May 1919. It suffered another raid in September 1920. And again, then in May, June, and July 1921. And at least two of these occasions, the raiders explicitly warned the light keepers not to inform the police or the military. And George James, who was the George James, was the principal keeper at Minehead, he informed Irish Lights head office that he hadn't notified the police of the raid at the station in May 1921, as owing to the state of affairs here, I'm quoting him, owing to the state of affairs here, it is most dangerous to do so. And I was warned not to inform the military police. If I gave information to the police or military, I would be looked upon as an informer and treated accordingly. So you know, the threat is very, very implicit in terms of what would happen if he actually drew the attention of the military authorities to the raids. What, what happens then from May 1920 is that we get an increasing sense of desperation from Irish lights in their appeals for assistance and military protection, both from the army and from the Dublin Castle administration. But, you know, British forces were stretched too thinly to provide adequate protection. And, you know, you can see from the map that's up on the screen that only the north and northeast coasts, stretching from Fannet Head in Donegal down to St. Uh, John's Point in County Down, remained immune from raids. Uh, so light keepers, fog signal men, they didn't have the training and I'm sure they didn't have the inclination to confront armed raiders. So William Henry Davis, who was the inspector and marine superintendent for Irish Lights, he met with senior Dublin Castle officials during the summer of 1920, seeking advice on how Irish Lights could ensure that they were able to still operate the much, the, obviously the essential fog signals around the coast, and yet keep their stores of explosives safe from raids. Um, the best advice that was offered to them was to reduce the reserves of explosives at certain stations to just 24 hours. And that was of little assistance in areas where fog could be, could lie, uh, could lie for days. There was a system put in place where the majority of Irish Lights explosives were stored in military garrisons and distributed as needed, maybe two, three, four, five days supply distributed as needed. Um, similar in a way to a just-in-time supply chain, but leaving the stations at risk of running out if there were any problems with delivery of the explosives. Um, so the IRA's intelligence networks were particularly well informed about when explosives were delivered to lighthouses and to fog signal stations. And just to give you a couple of examples of the efficacy of those, those networks you have here uh, on the slide and note, um, it's from military archives in, in Cahill Brewer, which gives information that the, the Dunleary intelligence officer has reported that the Kish lightship has several tons of cordite and gun cotton and the response, um, and he wants it, permission to go to carry out a raid. The response at the bottom of the note, you'll see it in a different hand at the bottom of the note, that's from, it's from Michael Collins and he says, I'd like the above checked carefully. If it's correct, of course, we should get the stuff. And no raid on Kish actually took place, probably because it was checked carefully and it was ascertained that the Kish didn't actually have the amount of explosives on board that was believed at the time. Um, and as another example, I suppose, just of how well informed the IRA were of, of movements, we have here on this slide, I want to give you an example of a raid on the Mizzenhead fog signal station that took place on the 31st of July, 1920. Now, at 6 p.m. on the 29th of July, the station received a large delivery of charges and detonators from the military. And just 20 hours later, in the early morning of 31st of July, the 3rd Corps Brigade of the IRA raided the lighthouse. And... In a short account sent to Irish Lights HQ, the lightkeeper, Frederick Duffy, reported that the raiders left with 11 cases of charges and 2,000 detonators, and that the key to the lighthouse magazine, so you know the ability to protect future deliveries, was demanded in the name of the Irish Republic. And the assistant keeper who was on duty at the time, James O'Connor, was left with no course but to comply. So again, you get that sense that there was, while the, while the lightkeepers weren't physically harmed, there was certainly an element of intimidation and threats. And warnings that they, if, if they weren't to comply with the demands, there probably would be, it would be trouble. It's never stated as such openly, but I think that we can read that implicitly from the reports that are, are being sent back to Irish Lights HQ. Um, what's, what's interesting about this one, of course, is that we have 
an account from the IRA side of things as well. So on the left-hand side of your slide, you have the report from the principal keeper. Um, and on the right-hand side, you have a, a later account gathered as part of the Bureau of Military History project, which gives the Raiders perspective. Um, and it's by Morris Donegan of Bandon. And it just gives you a sense of how important these, um, these explosives were to, to the IRA's uh, campaign. Um, if I just skip ahead to the last part of it, we got all the stuff, he says, we got all the stuff away in a lorry we had brought for the purpose and eventually stowed away safely in a prepared dump. We disposed of the cylinders in which the gun cotton and tonite were packed and the explosives themselves were those used in all the mines subsequently prepared for our war against the British in West Cork. Now the raid on, on Mizzenhead was actually a turning point in the system that had been implemented of keeping the main store of explosives under guard with regular deliveries wasn't working. Throughout the summer of 1920, Irish Lights received a number of urgent requests from Mizzenhead and other lighthouses uh, reporting dwindling stocks of explosives and requesting immediate resupply. So, for example, Mizzenhead reported less than 24 hours worth of explosives uh, in the summer of 1920. So there's a logistical pinch point and Irish Lights are struggling to ensure the continuity of fog signaling services. And it was also clear that without an actual military guard at each lighthouse, there was no guarantee that the explosives on site wouldn't be stolen. Um, as a final note, as a final act, I suppose, in the fog signal um, station saga and in the ability or in the attempt to protect the stocks of explosives that they had, Irish Lights warned that they would have to fully suspend all fog signals around the coast, endangering, um, endangering shipping uh, as a result. And Hubert Cook, or sorry, the, the Secretary J.B. Phelps wrote to the Admiralty and the Undersecretary of the Irish Government in August 1920 to say, in view of possible marine disaster and loss of life consequent upon such action, that is, suspending all fog signals, the commissioners feel that the closing down of these stations should be avoided if by any means possible, and have directed me again to urge upon you the extreme gravity of the situation. They feel, however, that in the absence of adequate protection, they have no alternative as to replenish the stock under existing conditions would, in their opinion, be criminal folly. Now, with neither the government nor the military prepared to provide further protection or military protection at individual lighthouse stations, fog signals at Hookhead, the Old Head of Kinsale, Loophead, Powerhead and Roaches Point were all discontinued. And later on, Eagle Island was also one of the ones that was discontinued. Now, in terms of raids, there had been an assumption that the more remote island stations would be safe, yet I suppose maybe one of the most spectacular raids on a lighthouse was actually against uh, Fastnet in June 1921. There is a very interesting and thrilling description of the raid from the IRA perspective, uh, which paints a very dramatic and quite romantic picture. And you can find that in the Bureau of Military History at Witness Statement 1518. But I want to give you an account of one of the lightkeepers who was on site at the time, John Crowley. Uh, again, it's short as a matter of fact, but it does give some insight into the treatment that the lightkeepers were getting or would get from the raiders. So he says that on the morning of the 20th at 1 a.m., Fastnet was raided by iron men who ordered me to put up my hands while in bed and then ordered us to get up and dress. Some of the raiders rushed up to the services room and smashed the transmitting key of wireless instrument. I was then ordered to keep watch on the light while the other keepers were ordered to lead way to the magazine. I asked the leader to leave me a supply at the same time telling him of the danger we were in running of running short. He said he would leave me 24 hour supply and to communicate with my authorities and inform them of the raid. And that's quite an interesting contrast with other raids where keepers were told not to say anything. And I wonder if there was a growing awareness among IRA you know, um, commanders that depriving fog signal stations of their explosives was a danger, not just to international shipping, but to local shipping. And I think the raid also demonstrates that even the fast net was was open uh, to, 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 I suppose, a daring attack. The key was that the door to the lighthouse had been left open um, overnight. And once the instruction was issued that they had to lock the door on the lighthouse, it's not hard to sort of, I suppose, um, figure out why they would have left the door open. It wouldn't have been expected to have visitors on the fast net uh, at any stage. It weren't expected. Um, so once that was, it meant that Irish lights could continue to send explosives to fast net at least because it was practically an impregnable fortress once the iron doors at the bottom of the tower were locked um and that was considered absolutely essential fast net obviously is crucial as an aid to navigation the fog signal also and in the opinion of our site engineer it had to be maintained at all costs so i, I could keep going on into into 1923 and give you more accounts of raids but i i, I hope those examples give you a flavor of what was happening 
And, and really from an Irish light perspective, the identity of the Raiders between 1919 and 1923 didn't really matter. Mitigating their effect on the service as best as possible was the primary goal. And before I move on to the treaty itself and, and, and its effect on, on Irish lights, I just want to briefly highlight some of the, the, I suppose, the longer term consequences of the wartime conditions that Irish lights operated under between 1914 and 1923. Um, so it wasn't until the, the end of June 1924 that all of the fog signal stations were restored to operational status. Hook Tower, the Old Head of Kinsale and Mizzenhead were restored at the end of 1923 with Loop Head and Eagle Island restored in June. And as Cook warned, this was, you know, it, had, it meant that there was a serious and dangerous inconvenience to shipping for over a year, uh, sorry, for, for, for more than uh, three years. Uh, and that was a point made by the Clyde Shipping Company. You can see their letter here uh, on the slide where, and Clyde, they operated out of Glasgow. And they wrote to the commissioners in June 1924, requesting the resumption of the signals due to their very real value to shipping, navigating the west coast of Ireland. Now, the plans for those restorations, like I said, were already in motion. And this is a notice to mariners that was um, distributed in June 1924 giving notice that Eagle Island and Loophead would soon be back in operation. And these were the last two. So once by the end of June 1924, normal service had been resumed in terms of fog signaling. Uh, the Admiralty also issued a notice at the end of the month stating that all lights and fog signals on the Irish coast were now reliable. That's their word. Um, now there were other tangible, I suppose, wartime effects. And one of the issues that I haven't really touched on, and it was universal across Ireland and Britain and Europe, of course, was the scarcity of supplies and raw materials during the First World War and in the years after. And this manifested itself in a variety of ways for Irish lights. They had difficulties carrying out repairs, um, maintaining, uh, operating regular maintenance, et cetera, of their equipment, which is especially relevant when so much of their plant and their equipment um, is exposed to particularly harsh weather conditions. So, uh, in February 1915, for example, Irish Lights coal suppliers, uh, James Waldy and Sons of Glasgow, wrote to say that the extraordinary developments of the past few months had caused an enormous increase in costs and that they were going to pass on those costs to their customers, including Irish Lights, by raising prices on house, furnace and canal coal. And the shortage of materials, I suppose, might have been most keenly felt in attempts to replace the lightship Guillemot, which I mentioned was sunk by U-boat while stationed at South Arklow in March 1917. Now, it was lost at a particularly bad time because at least one other lightship, the Petrel, had been condemned and was in urgent need of replacement. And there's a note on file stating that it was needed without delay in order to avoid the very real danger of a breakdown in the lightship service. There were always one or two spares docked in Kingstown, but the, I suppose the margin for error and the margin for having more than one or two out of service or loss at sea was very, very slim. So finance for a new lightship was agreed in 1920, but it wasn't until March 1923 that this was actually completed and delivered to Irish Lights and Tenere. And you have on the slide there, uh, on the left-hand side, schematics of the lightship. It was called the Guillemot II. Um, and on the right-hand side, you got pictures of the of the lightship in the graving dock. They're, they're, they're not great, but they're, they're from a, a magazine, the Shipbuilding and Shipping Record, that was published in April 1923. So they do, they do give you a good sense of what the lightship, what the lightship actually looked at. And it was built by John Cran and Somerville Limited, who a shipbuilder's base in Leith in Scotland. And construction was delayed for the most part by a shortage of iron, which meant that a new specification for a lightship built entirely from steel, which hadn't been done before for, for the lighthouse service, was drawn up. What that meant, though, was that the cost was reduced significantly down to £18,000, which is substantially cheaper than the projected cost of a ship built from iron and steel. So there was some benefit, I suppose, uh, to the delay. Now, I'm just going to run very quickly through the, the treaty itself and how the, the anglo irish Treaty in 1921 had a direct bearing on Irish lights. Uh, you'll be familiar, this is from the annex of the treaty, and you'll be familiar with the main provision of the annex because it dealt with what became known as the treaty ports. That's the, the ports of Loxwilly in County Donegal, and in Cork, Bearhaven, and Queenstown, obviously later renamed Cove, and these remained under the control of the British Navy until 1938. But the annex also stipulated, and you can see the paragraph there, paragraph 2b, 
that at some unspecified point in the future, and that was key, the, the, the date and time was never specified, a convention would be made between the British and Irish Free State governments to formalise a number of arrangements, including, in, like I said, you can see it in the paragraph, lighthouses, buoys, beacons, and any navigational marks or navigational aids shall be maintained by the government of the Irish Free State as at the date hereof, and shall not be removed or added to except by agreement with the British government. Now, during negotiations, responsibility for control and funding, funding was key also for Irish Lighthouse, that had been placed on the agenda early by the British. And in a list of conditions they submitted in October 1921, they stipulated that, quote, some reasonable arrangement about lighthouses must be made. Now, delegates on both sides were acutely aware of the geopolitical importance of Irish Lighthouses and of lightships to Britain's commercial and military interests, to the shipping it's with shipping businesses and shipping interests, which were uh, enormous. The, the, the scale of those interests utterly dwarfed those of the free state. Um, and the free state negotiators were determined to avoid having to bear the cost of Irish lights. And the expectation within Irish lights itself was that the treaty and the subsequent establishment of the free state and of Northern Ireland would mean that the service would now be divided between the two governments. But during a meeting with the Provisional Irish Free State Government's Department of Economic Affairs in February 1922, they were informed that pending the signing of the convention, the Irish Free State Government had no responsibility for Irish Lights. And until that convention had been agreed, Irish Lights was to continue to operate as normal. And that was how things continued. The convention to transfer control of Irish Lights or to divide the service between North and South never materialised. Neither government was willing to formally cede authority over any part of the North and East Coast of Ireland, North and Northeast Coast of Ireland to the other. And agreement on the mechanism for financing Irish Lights also proved elusive. And it's probably worth just making a quick point here on finance. In 1921, only 7% of Irish Lights yearly expenditure was covered by the, the light dues it levied on ships calling in Irish ports. And the shortfall was covered by dues collected in Britain. The light dues were a levy paid by ships in their port of call. And as so much of the transatlantic shipping passed Ireland, thereby making use of its lighthouse and its navigation, but without stopping in port, they paid the levies in Britain into the general lighthouse fund. And that was then used to subsidize the Irish service. That was a very smooth system prior to 1922, 1922 but a sticking point thereafter. And over the decades that followed, there were several attempts to find a solution to this financial and administrative conundrum. And I won't go into them in detail here. Um, I, I want to pause it there with the treaty, except to say that for the next number of years, Irish Light existed in this vacuum of information and in a state of limbo, constantly drafting and creating plans of how it might divide the service, how it might finance the service, how it might work with different, whether the Northern Irish government or the Irish the Free State government or the British government to continue the service, but never fully aware and never fully able to clarify this position. It was never really taken into negotiations. Its opinion was never sought by either the British government or the Irish Free State government um, in any real detail during the 1920s. And that was a major problem for Irish Lights. And it was a major sticking point, I think, to finding a solution to the problem as well. Now, Irish Lights' own position on the future of the service was pretty clear. Their preference was for the maintenance of the integrity of the service. Um, their chief engineer, C.W. Scott, drew up a report on the 23rd of January, 1922, just a couple of weeks after the acceptance of the treaty by Dáil Éireann. And he sketched out a potential division of the service between Northern Ireland and the Free State, but ended by declaring, all this expense and bother can be saved and more satisfactory working ensured if the service is retained as one entity. And whether by design or default, that was precisely what ensued. Now, I'm just going to finish by putting up this, uh, this picture of a lightkeeper standing in Kilcarry Bay, Straw Island, in, in June 1908. He's, he's watching the commissioners of Irish Lights inspecting party to parse, and it's a well-known picture. I think it's quite evocative of the life of, of a lightkeeper, and a lot of what I've talked about this evening relates to how the broader, relates to the broader impact of the events of 1914 to 23 on Irish Lights and its ability to fulfill its mission. But I've also tried to paint little pen pictures of what conditions were like on the ground for their employees. And one of the goals of the work that I'm doing with Irish Lights at the moment is to try and explore the history, not just of Irish Lights as an organization, but also to highlight the experiences of its employees. And I hope that tonight has given you 
at least a small insight into the impact of the First World War, War of Independence, the Civil War and the treaty as seen from those stationed around the coast. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for, for that. I'll hand back over to you, Hugh. Thanks, Owen. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. And uh, I was particularly interested in the way that you were able to take the content from our own archive and uh, bring it to life, uh, you know, and weave it into the context of the, the broader historical uh, history, uh, you know, of its time. And uh, also the one that really caught my eye there was the um, uh, the, the way you were able to sort of map the different sources uh, of uh, information, particularly the one from the, the military archives in Cal Brewer Street, you know, to give us two sides of the same story, uh, one from the IRA and one from the, the, the lighthouse keeper at the time. So I'm just looking at, uh, at some of the questions that have come in. Quite a number of them uh, relate to uh, questions uh, from uh, relatives of former um, Irish Lights employees, light keepers in particular. And what I'd suggest for those particular questions, if you could drop them into info at irishlights.ie, we'll do our best to, to get those specific questions. Uh, I have one or two here. Um, Owen, the first one was, um, uh, were there any losses of life due to uh, non, the non-function of fog signals uh, after, after the raids? Yeah, I, 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 it's, it's a great question. It's one that immediately occurred to me was what kind of effect did this have? What was the, the practical effect? I mean, the, the danger there, and what's one thing I didn't mention in this is that, I mean, Irish Lights, were, they, were, they were so concerned about this. They wrote letters to the newspaper, um, to national newspapers, requesting the public, implicitly requesting the public to put pressure on the IRA to stop these raids because they were so worried about the, the impact on the service. I, the short answer is I haven't come across anything which would suggest that there was any wrecks which were caused specifically because the, the fog signals weren't in operation for that time. The only thing that I can come up with, there was I think was the SS Trada or Trana was wrecked in 1909 at Mizzen Head. Uh, and it's the reason why Mizzen Head Fog Signal Station was built uh, because the captain said that he, he blamed the fact that he ran aground on the fact that there was no fog signal letting him know how close he was to the coast. So I don't, ha I don't think that there were. I think it's something that probably would have popped up, but you know, it, it might well still be in the, it might well still be in the, the archives, but I, I guess I would have come across it in the in newspaper reports if there had been. Yeah, okay, that, that's great. I have one here um, owned from uh, a grandson of Daniel the Nabro O'Driscoll. He's a former long-time ser long serving uh, member of Irish Lights and uh, his grandson wants to hear if there were any IRA raids in, on the Bull Rock or Roan Carrig or Bantry Bay, if you have any specific information on those. Were there, were there raids or? Um... Yeah, were there raids, yeah. Oh yeah, um, I don't think so. No, but oh, sorry, Bull Rock, yes, Bull Rock was raided, absolutely. And there is specific information on, on those. I mean, every every raid, every, every point of information that I have on that map is, is drawn from um, Irish Lights Archive itself. So that's all coming from reports or coming right from the keepers. So if there's any particular, you know, any particular raid that people are looking for information on, then that, that is accessible and, and it is possible to get that, the kind of the details. As I said, though, some of the reports are quite, they're quite, um, well, they're very matter of fact, and sometimes it's just three lines: lighthouse raided, you know, X amount of explosives stolen, binoculars stolen, signaling lamp stolen, and that's it. Request, request, resupply, and, and that's kind of the end of it. It's 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 an interesting way of having those um, having those events recorded, and it's why it's you know I, I get quite excited when I see the longer reports from the lightkeepers, which give more detail. And like you said, when you can compare and contrast them with the 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 Bureau of Military Histories. Um, archive and how you see it from the two the different perspectives. Yeah, no, that's great. I have a question here from someone just asking us, um, have we any plans for further webinars covering later periods? But I think, as, as I might have mentioned at the very start, we, we have this project as going through the Irish Lights Archive. I think Neve has it up to uh, 1937 at this stage. So, uh, you know, we've catalogued all that material and um, you know, hopefully we, we will have other outreach events that, that will follow on from that. Uh, I, I 
someone here who lives in, in Scaries in North County Dublin, they were asking, was, was there any raids on Rockabill Lighthouse? Not that I've come across yet. Not that I've come across. It doesn't mean that it didn't happen, but I, I haven't found it yet. Um, so I would suspect not. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, someone here is... <laughs> I'm always, <laughs> yeah. always liable if you're wrong. Yeah, uh, someone here is just saying uh, for our information that uh, Duncanon is, is incorrectly positioned on our map, right? But we'll we, we, we fix, we fix that for the next time. Thanks for that. Um, I, I, if anyone has any, any other questions, if you'd like to pop them into the, the chat, please. Uh, I think that's the end of the questions that I see if I'm, if, if I'm looking at them all here. Okay, well, um, look, uh, but I'd just like to wrap up by say say that uh, I think we all had a, a really enjoyable um, uh, time tonight. Owen, oh, thank you very much for um, uh, for your presentation. It was fascinating, very interesting, um, a real one for the, the history enthusiast. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, my colleague uh, Denise Beardmore who, for for ensuring that we had no technical uh, hiccups tonight, and. Uh, you know, I wish everybody the best and hopefully you can uh, join us again uh, in the near future for, for, for another webinar. So with that, I'd say goodnight. Thanks very Thank much. You. Matt. lots of uh, if you want to have a look at the the chat uh, their own you can see the appreciation for the talk yeah no de de delighted and it's actually uh, one of the things that I, I sort of always